It's strange how I cling to things that remind me of great joy and great sadness. They become precious, though they are often infused with pain. And it reminds me of our point, uh, the point God always has a purpose for my pain. One thing that I cling to is rather absurd. Do you know what this is? It's an it's a, it's a empty toilet paper roll, to be precise. Uh, now what you can't see is what's written on it, May 27th, 1989. Uh, and inside of it, inside of it you can see there's a map that's drawn of, of Jamie Neuenschwander's house. Okay. Now, what, what does any of that mean? That little toilet paper roll and that map was, was drawn, well, the toilet paper roll was kept and the map was drawn by my little brother. Uh, you see, about a month before he was killed in a car bicycle accident, I took him toilet papering. Okay. Now, I sermon review committee, she was like, make sure they know he wasn't killed while toilet papering with you. <laughs> okay. He was not. But a month beforehand, we went out. And after his death, we were going through his stuff the way you do. And this was one of his treasured uh, pieces. And so now it's mine. It became very precious on June 29th, 1989, a month later when he was killed. So we cling to these things. Today we'll begin a series from the book of Job. The story of a man who experienced great pain in his life. And in today's text, at one point we will see him with an object that he found. A broken piece of pottery to cling to and perhaps give him some sort of relief. In the midst of his pain, my question to you, and the way you can help me with this sermon series is, are there objects in your life, are there little pieces of your pain that you cling to? If there are things, symbols of pain, things that you cling to, I would like to know about them. And if the story of that thing can be fit on a half to three quarters piece of paper and you'd like to give it to me and if I feel it would work in with our text as we move through Job I will share that symbol with SMC now I have enough symbols of my own that we could move through the whole series but if there is a symbol that you cling to that is meaningful to you I would like to know about it and if again if you wish to share it with me and then perhaps if the Lord wills I can share it with SMC. Now, you can put those descriptions in my mailbox or you can email them to me. And I would love to, to work at integrating that into the sermon. Now, speaking of the sermon, is it okay if we get to it now? Yeah. Okay, you need to open your Bibles to a book where we have never gone before, the book of Job. Job 1 1. You need to know that Job is a book that is cloaked with mystery. No one knows exactly how old the book of Job is, only that it is the oldest book in the Bible. No one knows exactly the time period it describes, except that it's sometime after Adam, and likely sometime before Abraham. And we don't know the earthly author of the book, But the divine inspiration of this book is completely unquestioned, at least by me. The entire book could be summarized in one word, and that is pain. Last winter, a brave bunch of us dove into this book and spent 70 days reading and exploring it together. And for me, one of the most shocking things in this old, Old Testament book is that Jesus popped in every now and then. Jesus would peek around the corner of these pained pages 
and show up. Powerful prophetic proclamations about a savior, a redeemer, a healer were whispered and at times shouted through the pain. Yes, Job is a painful, pain-filled book. But it's also a book of hope and a book of promise. This mini-series will hopefully help us see Jesus in the midst of our pain. And that we will have the faith to press through our suffering. And like Job, arrive on the other side, knowing and trusting God more than we did before. Okay. Like that great anthem of the 80s. we got a long way to go and a short time to get there. So did you finally get to Job? That was a lot of time to turn pages. I don't hear any turning now. 538 in your student Bible. If you forgot your Bible at home or, you know, you forgot it out at the Shell Reunion, there's Bibles on the ends of your pews. Uh, they're there for you to use. It's on page 538 is where we start with Job. I'm just going to be straight with you. I'm going to cover a lot of text. So stay with me. It's, it's narrative. It's story-like. It's supernatural. But we're going to be flying through. So just stay with me. Keep your eyes on the text. And we'll make it through, okay? Here we go. Job 1.1. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. And he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys. And had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the east. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice burnt offerings for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. One day... The angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then. Everything he has is in your hands. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. If you've written some stuff down on your outline, I want to give it to you. Job was rich, religious, righteous, and resented. Job was rich. Religious, righteous, and resented. In verses 1 through 12, we find Job was indeed rich, religious, righteous, and resented. You could say that Job had it made in the shade with lemonade. He had it all. And here's the kicker. He deserved it. He was a good man. Even God praised this man as being an example of how to live. No one would question Job's integrity except... Satan, the accuser. The name Satan actually means accuser. You can see that in your NIV footnotes down there, and that's exactly what he was doing. Verses 6 through 12 are among some of the most terrifying and disturbing verses in all of Scripture, in my humble opinion. That is, until I try to put it in context to comfort myself. Who's talking first? Tell me. Who's talking first in this text? 6 through 12. Go ahead. You're allowed to say it. God, the Lord. Thank you. So let's remember who God is. To keep it in the context, we need to remember who God is. And because God is big, I'm going to need to use some big words that all start with omni. We need to remember, I believe, first and foremost, 
that he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. So for Satan to show up, it doesn't surprise God because God is everywhere. He knows where Satan is. There was no surprise here. He's also omnipotent or all powerful. God is in complete control of the situation. Satan can't pick and poke at just anyone. God points out Job like a proud father and says, I'm proud of you, boy. Interestingly, do you remember back in the gospel? Right after Jesus was baptized in Matthew 3, 17, words from heaven came very similarly. God says, I'm proud of you, boy. That's what God said to Jesus. Do you remember what happened right after? Right after he was baptized, what happened? Taken into the wilderness for temptation. We see Jesus peeking through. Finally, God is omniscient. God is omniscient. He knows everything from the start to the beginning. He knows that Job will pass the test. This is where we need to step back because omniscience messes with our head more than anything I know. Because our human minds are so small and so frail, we can't can't conceptualize it. What am I saying when I'm saying God is omniscient? That he knows everything. Am I saying he knows what you're going to have for breakfast tomorrow? Yes, he does. He does. Does he know who you will marry and who you will not marry? Yes, he does. He does. Does he know if you will get cancer? Or get in a car wreck? Does he know the day that you will die? Does he know that you will either go to heaven or hell? Yes, he does. Ooh. This should immediately make us ask the question. Do I know who this God is? If he knows all that, do I know him? And do I trust him? These are the questions you should be wrestling with when we read things like this. But then we have to identify the other speaker in the text. Who's the other voice that we hear in the text? Satan. Old scratch. The devil. We notice sarcasm, cynicism, and contempt flavor his acidic accusations. Because you see, Satan hates God and he hates the people that bear God's image. You need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt, the devil wants you dead. Okay? He wants you dead as soon as possible. And if he can't get you dead, he's going to get you wounded and he's going to blame God on your wounds. Okay? You need to understand that very clearly. It's going to come towards the end of the text today. That will be illustrated uh, in a very powerful way. But then the question comes, why did God point out Job to the hater? Why did he do it? Why did he point him out? Would you want God to say, hey, check out Justin. Hey, check out John. Hey, check out Mary. Why would he do that? Why did he put Job in jeopardy? Just remember, God knows how this will turn out. He knows That you and I today have the exact same enemy. And we will face many similar trials and temptations. Oh God help us. Not all of them. Not all the trials that Job did. But some of them you will. I guarantee it. Because you're alive. So if you can look back. On this book. And you can see somebody who actually made it through. Maybe deep down in your heart, deep in your soul, maybe in the midst of that trial, you will be able to say, maybe I can make it through too. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Oh my. I didn't put the application questions on there. And I didn't put them in my sermon. So let me see if I can remember them. (laughs) Application question. How have you been tested? How have you been tested? How has God allowed testing into your life? I would never try to tell you what to talk about over dinner today. But that could make for interesting dinner time conversation. How have you been tested? Have you told your kids? Did you make it through? Did you pass the test? Did you fail? Oh, if you fail, the kids will listen. They sure will. Why don't you talk about it? 
we got to keep moving. Now we'll see how tough the test gets. Buckle in. 13 through 22. One day when Jesus is... I'm sorry. One day when Job's sons... Jesus didn't have no sons. Here we go. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabians attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came. And said, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house. When suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up, tore his robe shaved his head and fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Job was ripped off, ruined, and reverent. Job was ripped off, ruined, and reverent. So if I could ask you, what was the most painful day of your life? What was the worst day of your life? What would it be? I bet it would involve disappointment. I bet it would involve loss, perhaps even death. It may have come suddenly with no reason. Everyone's loss is different. Everyone's loss is different, and I don't mean to minimize it, but I just don't know anyone, maybe you do, I don't, I don't know anyone who has lost as much as fast as Job did and had it announced to him. I believe everyone in this room has experienced loss and the pain that comes with it, a dream, a business, a friend, a child, an attack of the enemy left you in pain. Can I just ask you this? How did you respond? How did you respond on the worst day of your life? Friends, if you don't get nothing else out of this sermon, please, would you please just get this? In fact, if you don't get nothing out of this series, would you please just get this? Just grab it. Chew on it for the rest of the month. I call it the golden prayer of praise in verse 21. I call it the second most powerful prayer in the whole Bible. What's the most powerful prayer in the whole Bible? I believe it's from Luke twenty-two forty-two, 42, when Jesus says, not my will, but thy will be done. When he was in the garden, the garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane means to crush. We find Job in a similar garden. Actually, we don't find Job in no garden at all. He's in a wasteland of pain. And that's where I believe this second most powerful prayer was uttered. Look at it in your Bible. Back up to verse 20. Fill in the blank for me. He fell to the ground in worship. Can I just confess? I I don't know about you, but I, I feel it very difficult to worship when I'm being crushed. Do you? I struggle with that on a regular basis. But I know I need to. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Read verse 21. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Read it. Tuck it away in your memory. 
It's biblical emergency gear. Now you need to know that the deep theological reason for that statement comes in the next text. But for now, I just want you to ponder this prayer of release and make it yours. Make it yours because you will have to use it in your life. I've heard it echoed by the Nickel Mines Amish. I've heard it echoed by the Charleston church members as they forgave people who caused them pain. This isn't a prayer of cheer. This isn't a hip, hip, hooray, happy face, band-aid on a gaping, open, emotional wound. This is submission and surrender to a God who cares and loves us and is sovereign. And we're going to trust him. Jesus said it with the same conviction. Not my will, but thy will be done. Echoing Job, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. So how do you respond on your most painful day? That's your application question. How did you respond on your most painful day? That's the easy application question. The hard one is, how are you going to respond on your next most painful day that might actually be more painful than the previous one? How are you going to respond? Are you going to fall down and worship? Are you going to say in the midst of your pain, in spite of your pain, the Lord's name be praised? I hope we can remember Job's words and worship and try to keep the faith when it all falls apart. Now we need to go just a little bit deeper and then I'm going to let you go. We're going to wade deeper into the pain as we read chapter 2 verses 1 through 10. Are you still with me? All right, nudge that person beside you. Say, we're in, the, we're in the last leg here. Go ahead, nudge him. Nudge him. We're going to make it. We're going to make it. Hold with me. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. Also, do you realize that you can hear about four times faster than I can read? Some of you are sitting there going, why is he reading so fast? You can actually hear four times faster than I can read. Okay, so I'm just, I'm speeding it up. You'll be okay. On another day, the angels came and presented themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity Though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life. But stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones. And he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then. He is in your hands. But you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then he took jo- then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, "Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die." He replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Job was ravaged, rejected, and reflective. I used to believe that it was harder to watch those you love suffer than to suffer with pain yourself or illness. That was before I broke my back. Now I realize that that's not entirely true. Bodily pain is personally devastating. And I know some of you know that is true. And I'm just saying now I know with you. We tend to take our bodies in general and our health in particular for granted. Our bodies usually work like we want to. We get up and we walk around. We sit down and we eat. We lay down and we sleep. We go potty. We breathe. We take it all for granted until it stops. Or in the biblical 
world, in the Job world, until we are afflicted. Now, I'm not sure there's much that shakes your faith quite like the loss of health. Job's loss of wealth was bad. He was rich in family and finance. Then suddenly it was all gone. But he reverently worshipped. Now his health is gone. I brought up the pottery piece at the beginning of the sermon. I talked about those things that we cling to. I wonder if that piece of pottery, just imagine with me a little bit. I wonder if that piece of pottery was busted off of one of the dishes that they used at the, at the feasts. I wonder if that piece of pottery what was a busted handle off one of the pitchers he used in the purification rites for his children. I wonder if that piece of pottery was a busted piece of cookie jar that his ten kids used to raid. For some reason, Job held on to that thing and it became a back scratcher for him. And it gave him a little bit of relief. Too bad his wife didn't give him any relief. Now, before we're too hard on her, let's remember. She's been in pain, too. She's been in shock and in grief. And though it sounds hard, I've seen and heard loved ones say to those who are suffering, it's okay to let go. It's okay to go to God. I don't blame you. But sadly, in this text, there is a harshness here that is inexcusable. And Job confronts his wife with a sharp rebuke, trying to silence her, which he does for the rest of the book. However, it's more than a rebuke. There's a reflective brilliance to this wisdom. Even after the ruin of his family and fortune, in the midst of ravaging disease, Job can still recall brighter days, blessed days, that God had given him. This is incredible. He can see the good from God. Most of us, in our darkest hour, in our darkest hour, what's, what's, the, what's the cliche? Oh, can you see light at the end of the tunnel? Can you see any light at the end of the tunnel? Oh yes, a pin prick. I see just a pin prick of light at the end of the tunnel. Job don't do that. It's completely black. He sees nothing at the end of the tunnel. So what does he do? He actually turns around and he sees light back at the beginning of the tunnel. And he says, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it because there was light at the beginning of the tunnel. There's nothing but darkness at the end. But there's light at the beginning. I can see it. I can see it. I'm going to make it. I got the good from God. Now I'm getting the trouble. That's what we need to take. We can't take one without the other. This is incredible. He's thankful for seeing the trouble now. It almost seems like a balancing agent. Again, I can't help but think of Jesus' prayer, not my will, but thy will be done. Job and Jesus saw God's sovereign will as supreme. The only way for them, even if it involved pain, even if it involved the people who are closest to him, not understanding not getting it. Saying, give up, quit, die. They held on. I need to give you what I believe to be the three purposes of pain. Because the point is, God always give, has a purpose for my pain. I need to give you these three, then I'll let you go. I promise. Pain points out in this text, verses 1 through 12. Pain points out that we have an enemy. Friends, it's very popular these days to question the existence of God. If you question the existence of God, you end up questioning the existence of Satan. And you know what? If you want to get real philosophical about it, and I'll go there with you, although I don't like it, to argue philosophy. If you're going to, exi if you're going to question the existence of God, you've got to question the existence of Satan. And if you question the existence of Satan, then you've got to start questioning the existence of pain. Okay? And that's futile. The purpose of our pain in this text is so you know that you have an enemy. I believe Satan has been and always will be the greatest single pain provider in the world. Even though he tries to pin it on God. Look at verse 5 real quick. 
Look at verse 5. Satan says, stretch out your hand. Okay? He says to God, stretch out your hand. But then, flip down to verse 7. We see, so Satan afflicted. And we know that because we've read Revelation 21.4. Do you remember? Revelation 21.4. That in the end, Satan will be destroyed. And with him, pain. You can look it up. We're almost at the end. At the end, Satan will be destroyed and pain will be destroyed with him. I can't wait. So pain points to our enemy. Who's your enemy? Who's your enemy? Thanks, kid. That's right. I know it's easy to look at that person across the row. Maybe even the person sitting beside you. Maybe even that person at work. Oh, that's my enemy. No, it's not. You have an enemy. Don't get it confused. The second purpose of our pain. And there's three. Pain also points to our attitude of worship. In verses 13 through 22, we see all Job worked for disintegrate. Traumatic news was delivered. Rapid fire to this devout and devoted man of God. He loses about everything. And what is his response? Again, if you want to glance over at verse 20. He fell to the ground in what? And then in verse 21, he said, the Lord be praised. This is stunning. Pain points to our attitude of worship. Can I just ask, what is your attitude of worship? Mm, I'm so tired today. Oh, I don't think I'll go to worship. Mm, I'm actually in pain today. I got pain. You know what, folks? I know people who are sitting here right now. I'm not going to point them out. They're in pain. Okay, And a lot of them are in the older set. Okay, They're in pain. They're sitting here. In pain. What's your attitude of worship? What keeps you from worshiping? Finally, in verses 1 to 10, chapter 2, we see pain points to an attitude of life. This is beyond pessimism or optimism. This is beyond is the glass half full or half empty. This is the glass gets smashed to pieces All the pieces are swept up and thrown away. Are you still happy that you got a glass at one point? What's your attitude about life? Can you be thankful that God even gave you a glass to begin with? That he in his sovereignty gives and takes the good and the bad because he's God and I'm not. Everyone in this room has been, is now, or will soon experience pain I hope that through the witness of Job and the presence of Jesus you will find a purpose for your pain even today let us pray oh Lord we're in Job now and I'm going to ask that you help us help us understand what you have to say to us Lord, there are people sitting here right now in pain. Emotional pain, physical pain, spiritual pain. Lord, I pray that if they do not know you today, that they would come to a saving knowledge of you. Lord, Job in his best moments saw you, I believe. In the spirit, he knew that a savior was coming. And that's what we're going to preach about over the next few weeks. But for right now, Lord, somebody might need you. So I pray that in their hearts now, they would admit that they do. That... They're trying to fight the pain and it doesn't work. Admit that they have sin and they need to get rid of it. That they believe that you came to take our sin, to take our pain. And Lord, finally, that they would commit to following you and knowing you in the midst of the pain. Lord, we know that knowing you doesn't get us a get out of pain free card. But rather... It gives us a get through the pain with you card. And that's your word. Lord, help us to absorb it today and in the days to come. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.